Now for the next installment in Judges, No King in Israel. This morning, we are introduced to a significant leader in the book of Judges, Gideon. His military exploits and deliverance from the Midianite oppression will occupy the next few chapters. But chapter 6 will simply chronicle his calling, introducing us to an unlikely judge from an unlikely family called at an unlikely time in the Israelite story. Last week, we told the story and we drew out some application as we went and then sort of reflected together on what that story teaches us about the life of faith and about the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll do something similar this week. We'll see at least three things if you're taking notes. First, God calls us. Even in our doubts, God moves towards us. God is the one who calls us. The first thing we'll see from the calling of Gideon is that God is the active agent. Put simply, God calls us. The second thing we'll see is that God qualifies us. Even in Gideon's weaknesses and in our weaknesses, God makes us strong. The first thing we'll see is that God calls us. And the second thing that we'll see is that God qualifies us. Even in our weakness, God makes us strong. And third, and perhaps most importantly, we'll see that God is with us. He showed that to Gideon in his own way, but to us this morning, like through the work of Christ and in the person of the Spirit, God dwells with us. I'll remind us that God calls us. God qualifies us for the life to which he's called us, and God is with us as we live it. God calls us, God qualifies us, and God is with us. Let's look at the text. Judges chapter 6, verse 1. Let's approach the word of the Lord together. The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord gave them into the hand of Midian seven years. And the hand of Midian overpowered Israel. And because of Midian, the people of Israel made for themselves the dens that are in the mountains and the caves and the strongholds. For whenever the Israelites planted crops, the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them. They would encamp against them and devour the produce of the land as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance in Israel and no sheep or ox or donkey. For they would come up with their livestock in their tents. They would come like locusts in number. Both they and their camels could not be counted. So that they laid waste the land as they came in. And Israel was brought very low because of Midian. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help. Oppression has gotten worse and worse. The Midianites are the most powerful foe we've seen in the book of Judges yet. They have driven the Israelites completely underground in dens and caves, wherever they could escape their watchful eye and their strong arm. Israel was, the text says, brought very low by Midian. Israel's down bad, man, so they cried out to God for help. Now, if you're familiar with sort of the narrative arc of Judges, this is what happens. Like, Israel is down bad. In the midst of being down bad, they call out to God for help, and then God helps them. This is the point in the story in which you'd expect a deliverer judge. An Othniel, an Ehud, a Shamgar, someone like that. Thus far, this is when they've gotten one. They get in a bind, they call out to God, God sends them a deliverer. But a delivering judge is not what they get quite yet. Let's look at verse 7. When the people of Israel cry out to the Lord on account of the Midianites, the Lord sent a prophet to the people of Israel. And he said to them, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I led you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of slavery. And I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all who oppressed you and drove them out before you and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am the Lord, your God. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. Before God sends a judge to deliver, he sends a prophet to preach. His message, as is often the case with a prophet, is unpopular. He does not come speaking judgment upon the Midianites with a sword to carry his people out of oppression. Rather, he reminds the Israelites what the Lord God has done for them and why they are in the situation they find themselves. God convicts them of their sin before he rescues them from the consequences of their sin. This is important. Don't, Don't miss this. 
God convicts them of their sin before he rescues them from the consequences of their sin. God wants to move his people from simply regretting the consequences of their sin to actually repenting of their sin. I could preach a whole sermon here about the difference of regret and repentance. And I I won't do that, but it does warrant a brief moment of reflection. Regret, if you're taking notes, is fundamentally about us. Regret is fundamentally about us. You can regret the consequences of your sin without changing your mind about your sin. You can regret the fact that sin has brought into your life. You can regret the consequences without actually repenting of your sin. It happens every single day. Regret is fundamentally about us, but repentance is fundamentally about God. You're less focused on how your sin affects you and you rightly view it as an affront to God and his holiness, a blatant disregard of his love, a usurpation of his law. Paul teaches in the New Testament that sorrow, worldly sorrow, leads to death, regret, but godly sorrow leads to repentance and salvation. God here, when the people cry out amidst Midianite oppression, before he sends a judge to deliver, he sends a prophet to preach to move his people from simply regretting the fact that they are in this bind to repenting of the sin that got them in this bind. Oh, but a deliverer is yet coming. Look with me in verse 11. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth big oak tree at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abizrite, while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, the Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. So an angel of the Lord sits under the big oak tree, one that belongs to Joash. Gideon, Joash's son, is threshing wheat down in a wine press, which is actually not the best place to do that. Threshing wheat, you know, imagine like throwing it up and it comes down. You don't want to do it in a enclosed space, but he's down in the wine press doing this so that the Midianites don't see it. Because if the Midianites see that wheat go up in the air, guess what? That's now going to be Midianite wheat. Man, they're like the IRS on steroids. So they're hiding out. They don't want this wheat to be taken. They don't want to keep their head down, keep their eyes down, mind their own business. Gideon is doing menial daily work while hiding from Midianites, when an angel of the Lord appears to him and says, the Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. Gideon's response, verse 13, please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. This is hardly a response of faith. More on that soon. Let's keep telling the story. Verse 14, the Lord is unfazed. And the Lord turned to him and said, go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do I not send you? God has no interest in his questions, specifically because those questions are being answered implicitly. God is right here. God is sending Gideon to save Israel from the hand of Midian. But thinking, Gideon, this cannot be right. I'm not a mighty man of valor. I can't go and fight anybody. Verse 15, he said to him, please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, look, 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 my clan is the weakest in Manasseh. And I'm the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, but I will be with you and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. Gideon will not triumph in his own power. Gideon will triumph because the Lord will be with him. But before he goes off to battle, physical battle against the Midianites, the real spiritual battle must first take place. Allow me to summarize the rest of the text just for a moment, so we don't sort of read all the way down through it and get all glossy-eyed and fall asleep. Remember, idolatry is the big problem. It's the foundational problem. It's the root of all the other problems Israel faces. There are altars to false gods, Baal and Asherah, among the people of Israel, in Gideon's own home, whose family served as a sort of priest to the shrine of this false god. 
So before the Lord calls Gideon to go and take not very many men into battle, he calls him to go into his own home and to tear down the altars to Asherah and Baal and instead to sacrifice to the Lord God. So Gideon does this, but he's still not quite the mighty man of valor that God has called him. He does it, but he does it at nighttime so that no one will see it. No one will know what happens. He knows that if he gets caught tearing down Baal and Asherah, that people are going to be upset because people believe that their success, people believe that the good fortune in their life comes from these deities. And so if he eliminates them, then he has made the gods mad. And if you've ever seen a movie, you know that making gods mad is not a good thing to do. Sadly, he's right. He tears down these altars, he sacrifices to the Lord, and the people are angry. Skip ahead to verse 28. When the men of the town rose early in the morning, behold, the altar of Baal was broken down, and the Asherah beside it was cut down, and the second bull was offered on the altar that had been built. And they said to one another, who has done this thing? And after they had searched and inquired, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash, has done this thing. So they go get Joash. And they say, Joash, your son has torn down the gods. And now he is guilty for all that's going to happen to us in response. So we've got to take your son and we've got to kill him. Surely you understand. Go get him. Let's kill him right now. But in a moment of courage, Joash defends his son and challenges the people. Look in verse 31. But Joash said to all who stood against him, will you contend for Baal or will you save him? Whoever contends for him shall be put to death by morning. If he is a God, let him contend for himself because his altar has been broken down. Therefore, on that day, Gideon was called Jerubal. That is to say, let Baal contend against him because he broke down his altar. Joash says, Oh, you gonna you want to defend Baal? I thought Baal was a god. Surely Baal can defend himself if he's angry. And the people from that day called Gideon Jerubo, the one who broke down the altar. Before there was ever Gideon the warrior, there must first be Gideon the idol smasher. And Gideon the idol smasher will soon lead the people of God into battle. What can we see about this calling of Gideon that can be somewhat instructive and helpful for us in our life of faith? First, we see that God calls us. The emphasis in that brief sentence, God calls us, is on God. That even in our doubt, God moves toward us. Gideon is not presented to us as a model of faith. Throughout the passage, he is far from an exemplar of the type of person you think you should be. First, he responds to the angel of the Lord sarcastically, maybe, or at the very least, presumptuously. Now, who is this angel of the Lord? That itself is a very, very tricky question that has vexed biblical scholars for some time. We've seen a couple times in the Old Testament, a couple times in Judges. This shadowy angel of the Lord figure appears. We see this figure a couple of other spaces in the Old Testament. There are moments where this person, this angel, this messenger, just seems like one carrying a divine message. Referred to as an angel, that word just simply means messenger of the Lord. But there are times when the messenger himself seems to be divine. Like we see at times the text will say, the angel said, and then other times the text will just say, the Lord said. But verse 14 in this very text goes a step further and says, the Lord turned to him and said. So we have this idea that the one carrying this message is in some sense the Lord himself. In verse 22, Gideon perceives that this messenger is from the Lord. He says, alas, O Lord God, for now I've seen the messenger of the Lord face to face. Is this an angel? Perhaps. Is this a pre-incarnate appearance theophany of the Lord Jesus Christ? Perhaps. But we can say with confidence that Gideon's response to God, 
the messenger of God, whoever he is, is not one of faith. The first thing out of his mouth is a complaint in the form of a question. Now, we never complain in the form of questions, do we? If the Lord is with us, then what's all of this? (laughs) If the Lord is with us, then why are the Midianites with us too? If the Lord is with us, does he not know I'm threshing wheat in a wine press? Because if they see that, they're going to come and take it. They're going to take our stuff. They're going to take our produce. They're going to take our livestock. They're going to take our families. How can you say the Lord is with us while the Midianites are among us? If the Lord is with us, then why is all this happening? Is that not a question we ask today? If God is with us, then why do bad things happen? First, we need to realize that Gideon is actually just flat wrong. He has his facts mixed up. Did God forsake his people? No, they forsook him. That's the message of the prophet that God sent to preach before he delivers his people. They forsook the Lord their God by fearing pagan gods. Not only is Gideon misinformed or wrong about who forsook whom, but he misreads what the presence of the Midianites means. He misunderstands what it means that enemies dwell among them. Here's what I mean. The Midianite oppression is actually proof that God has not forsaken his people because God disciplines those he loves. Because the problem is not simply Midianite oppression. The problem is the presence of false gods. False gods who have shrines in Gideon's own home. In fact, God is using the Midianites to show his people that the gods of the nations are worthless idols. If Baal is mad, Baal can speak for himself. If Baal is so offended, let Baal come and do something about it. Only by, the, by experiencing the consequences of their idol worship will the people of God come to realize that idols do not deserve worship. That's a crucial idea. Only by experiencing the consequences of idol worship will the people of God come to realize that idols do not deserve our worship. God lets his people suffer to move them from regret to repentance. God lets his people suffer at the hands of Midianites to move them from regret that leads to death to repentance that leads to life. It's one thing to regret the fact that, oh, no, Midianites are here. Life's bad. And it's another thing to say, Midianites are here because we forsook the Lord our God. And if we want to get rid of the Midianites, we got to do the most basic and fundamental thing necessary. We've got to repent of worshiping these false gods, and we must turn in worship and devotion to the true and living God. God lets his people suffer to move them from regret, which leads to death, to repentance, which leads to life. Gideon misunderstands who broke the covenant. God didn't break the covenant. The people did. Gideon misreads what Midianite oppression means. He thinks it's proof that God has forsaken them. But in reality, it is proof that God is disciplining them so they would know the consequences of worshiping idols so that they could repent of worshiping idols and live. And third, Gideon does not know that the Lord is in fact working. Gideon does not know that the Lord is, in fact, about to display his wondrous deeds once again. Where is the God that grandma talked about, right? Where is the God who delivered us from Egypt? We hear these stories, right? We've heard the stories. They put the the blood over the door and they escape by night with their cloak and their Nikes on. And they they get out of town and all of a sudden they get to the ocean. They get to the ocean. The ocean splits and they run through the ocean. And as soon as they get through the ocean, the ocean comes back down and all the enemies are washed away. And there's the people. And then they go through the wilderness and God gives them food from heaven. God gives them a light from heaven. We don't know anything about this God, Gideon says. We've heard the stories. 
We've never seen him do anything like that. He may have split the seas for one generation, but we're threshing wheat in a wine press for crying out loud. He has no idea that God is actually about to bring good things to his people through him. He has no idea that he will soon be the answer to his question. Through whom will God show his wondrous deeds? Well, through, through Gideon. So his question is actually not a good one. But it's not unlike ours. Like Gideon, we are often tempted to see the troubles around us as proof that God has abandoned us. Instead of considering how God is working in and through all those troubles for our ultimate good, the good of others, and the glory of his name. Like Gideon, we want God to do good things for us, which I suppose is fine, but God is not simply interested in changing our circumstances. He is interested in changing us. <laughs> That's one of the biggest problems of, of prosperity theology today that says like, oh, God wants to get you through this and through this and there's a breakthrough coming and all this kind of stuff. Like God is not simply, and if you were to read the narrative of the Bible, you will find that God is not simply interested in taking his people into more and more blessing and prosperity, but God is actually interested in changing his people. God is actually interested in changing my heart. He's actually interested in making me the answer to someone else's prayer. He works for us, yes. He works for us that he might work through us. Gideon has no concept that, that he might be the one God's calling to go and lead his people out of oppression. Because Gideon doesn't understand that God is working in him and through him for the good of others. Like Gideon, we're tempted to see the problems around us as proof that God's just given up on us. Instead of having the faith to think, maybe I don't know every variable at play. Maybe I don't know why this had to happen. But I know this, that God uses all things and God works all things for his glory. And that as we preached about last week in the sermon, the chariot long in coming, that nothing is wasted in our lives. That God uses every bit of us, every bit of our lives, the good, the bad, the ugly, to tell his story. Like Gideon, we're often tempted to see troubles as proof that God is away without understanding that God is shaping us and molding us through those very things. Like Gideon, we want God to do things for us, but are often unaware that really God is interested in doing something in us and through us for the good of others. Where is God in this trouble? Oh, the message of Gideon is clear. He's with you. And he's going to use you to do something about it. Even in Gideon's doubt, God moves towards him. And even in your doubt, God moves towards you. It's God's decision. Gideon's faithlessness is not an obstacle to God's call. First, we see that God calls us, and the second thing we see in this text is that God qualifies us. In our weakness, God makes us strong. How does the Lord respond to Gideon's little faith? He, he's unfazed by it. Verse 14. And the Lord turned to him and said, go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do not I send you. So first God calls Gideon a mighty man of valor. That's a great thing to be called. Gideon responds with a faithless question. And then what does God respond to Gideon's faithless question? He affirms the call. He just says, go in your might and save Israel from Midian. Seemingly ignoring the very protest that comes from faithless Gideon. And there's a principle at work here. God does not call us because we are mighty and strong. God makes us mighty and strong. He does not call the mighty. He makes mighty the called. Gideon protests, he says, man, listen, I am from the weakest family in Manasseh. 
And not only am I from the weakest family in Manasseh, but I'm the weakest member of the weakest family in Manasseh. He's the runt. He's the one that everyone forgets about. At Christmas, they would gather around, give everyone gifts, and they'd say, oh, we forgot Gideon again this year. Gideon is the most unlikely commander, the most unlikely warrior, and certainly not a mighty man of valor. Gideon says he's the least in his own house, a house that's the least among the whole tribe. But God says Gideon is a mighty man of valor. Your translation might say a mighty warrior. So who is he? Is he a mighty warrior or is he a chump? Well, if God says you're a mighty man of valor, then guess what you are? You are a mighty man of valor. It reminds me of the New Testament church of Corinth, a church that has been remembered throughout history as a troubled church. It's got all kinds of things wrong doing all sorts of things that Christians ought not do. But the letter begins to the saints who are in Corinth. The Ephesian church is likewise not a perfect church, but Paul writes to them, it's the saints who are in Ephesus. Oh, the church in Philippi is not a perfect church, but the letter that Paul writes to them is addressed to the saints in Philippi. Guess what the struggling saints of the New Testament church in Corinth are called? They're called saints. This is what the Lord means when he tells the Ephesians to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. That God has called them saints so they learn to live as saints. God calls us and God qualifies us. God calls you to himself and then God teaches you what it looks like to live with him. God calls you a saint, Christian, and God makes you a saint. God calls you a saint and God makes you. He calls you a Christian before you act like one, look like one, think like one, and talk like one. And that his spirit inside of you then leads you to become who he's already made you. Gideon is very, very correct to know that he cannot drive out the Midianites on his own. But he does not yet know just how much the presence of the Lord will change things. Friends, God shows his power through us in our weakness. We talked about this in Ehud, the left-handed warrior. Give God your left hand that he may work through it. Without God, we can't do anything of spiritual value, of eternal value, of lasting significance. And we're good and right to mention that. Like without God, we are nothing. Without God, we can't do anything. But I, I, pastorally, I want to remind us of something. If you're here and you're a Christian, you're in Christ. Without God, you can do nothing. But you are not without him anymore. <laughs> I, I think that somehow gets lost and we become like spiritual defeatists. We talk about like, oh, we can't do anything without God. Well, that's a good point. That's good theology. That's very, very good to know that. But you also got to know that you're not without him anymore when you're joined to Christ. Without God, we can do nothing. But with God, the text says we can do all things. You are not without the Lord. You are not without spiritual power. You are not without spiritual potential. You are who God says you are, and you can do what God says you can do. Without him, we can't do anything, but with him, we can do immeasurably more, as Paul told the Ephesians in chapter 3, than we could ask or imagine. The presence of God with us makes all the difference. God calls us. Even in our doubt, he moves toward us. God hears our response and God says, I I didn't change my mind and I did not stutter. Gideon, you mighty man of valor, go in this might and save Israel for I'm with you. The presence of God makes all the difference. God takes the initiative. God calls us to himself despite our poor faith and bad decisions. And then God qualifies us for the task to which he has called us. We need only to stick with him. And Gideon realizes just how important it is that he's talking to the real and living God. The final thing we must see from this passage is that God is with us. Two times in the text that I did not read, Gideon seems to put God to the test 
in a, a somewhat bizarre way. So one of those times happened in verse 17 to 24 early in their interactions. Gideon says, okay, if you really are who you say you are, stay here and prove it, essentially. So Gideon prepares an altar with a goat and a bunch of unleavened cakes from a whole lot of flour. God tells him to put them on a rock and to pour broth over them. And then the angel of the Lord, as he's pouring the broth over this rock, he touches his staff to the rock and fire appears. That's when Gideon responds, oh, alas, oh Lord God, I have now seen the angel of the Lord face to face. So early in that interaction, Gideon wants to know, okay, is this really an angel of God? And God proves it in this way. Then again in verses 36 to 40. So after that interaction, Gideon is filled with faith to go and tear down the altars of these false gods. But now the battle is drawing nigh. It's almost time to go fight. And Gideon has to make super sure, like really, really super duper sure that this is actually God and God is actually with him. So in verses 36 to 40, the trumpets have been sounded, the army is being gathered, and this mighty man of valor who has all these questions is about to lead the people. But he's got to make sure that this God is who he says he is. So he takes a fleece of wool and he puts it on the ground. And he says, when I wake up, if there is dew on the fleece, but not on the ground, I will know that I'm talking to the real and living God. And so he goes to bed, he wakes up the next day, and sure enough, God has proven himself. But you can never be too sure. So he says, let's uh, reverse this. Tomorrow, if the fleece is dry and the ground is wet, then I'll know for certain that this is the living God. So he wakes up, the fleece is dry, and the ground is is wet. Now, as we draw near the end of this sermon, I have to make one thing very clear. Whenever you're reading narrative portions of the Bible, you have to be careful not to read those as prescriptive. Like, just because something is in the Bible does not mean the Bible commends that thing. Like, we see people with multiple spouses in the Old Testament. Does that mean God is commending that? No. We see the institution of slavery in the Bible. Does that mean God is commending that? No, the Bible tells the story of a real people in a real place, how the people live around them. So just because something appears in the Bible, in a story, does not mean that we can then say, well, this is how you prove God is with you. Go get a fleece and go get some flour and a goat. And we're gonna do what? And this is the problem that some preachers make if I'm being completely blunt. We can't say, we're going to do what Gideon did. Go get the wool. Let's have a Gideon party. That's just bad, 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 just bad. <laughs> this is not a justification to play little games with God. Like Gideon just needs to know that this is God. Gideon did not have what you and I have, a closed cannon. Gideon doesn't have the story of Gideon to go back on because guess what he's doing? He's living the story of Gideon. Gideon doesn't know about the person and work of Jesus Christ. Gideon doesn't have the apostles. Gideon doesn't have the prophets. Gideon doesn't have the sacraments. Gideon doesn't have 2,000 years of church history. Gideon doesn't have any of that. Gideon's an Israelite man amongst the Midianite people who have compromised their convictions, and he doesn't know which way is up and which way is down. And he needs to make sure that the person talking to him is not like those false gods. At the heart of Gideon's request is that God would strengthen his faith. And in love and grace, God responds with a wet fleece, a dry fleece, or fire on an altar. Brother, sister, you and I have something far better than a flaming sacrifice and a wet blanket to prove the presence of God with us. We have a bloody Roman cross and an empty Roman tomb. We have the Holy Spirit inside of us who Paul tells us is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. Worship team, you guys can come on up. 
Gideon's request is for more faith in the presence of God at these crucial moments of his life before he goes and topples the idols and then before he goes and fights. He doesn't need to to get everything figured out. He just needs to make sure that God is with him because if God is with him, then he will be faithful to do what he said he would do. We don't play games with God. The scriptures, in fact, teach us not to do that sort of thing. The scriptures teach us not to say, here, I'll do this and you do this. Jesus rejects that sort of tit for tat. But when you cry out to God with that honest prayer, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. God is faithful to answer. He is faithful to point you to the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the image of the invisible God, as we confessed earlier, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, be God to not made of the Father before all worlds. God is faithful to point you to Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ, who for us and our salvation came down from heaven, was made incarnate, lived a sinless life, died a substitutionary death, rose triumphantly over the grave, ascended bodily into heaven from whence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. And this Lord Jesus Christ, before he ascends into heaven, institutes a meal. And through this meal, he will mediate his presence. Through his word, he will mediate his presence. It's like a a wet blanket from Gideon for the faith of the Christian. It's like a flaming sacrifice on an altar. He institutes this meal through which he communicates himself to us. Because just like Gideon, You can face the trials and battles and struggles around you if you know for a fact that God is with you. That's all we need. And when we come to the Lord's table, when we observe the sacrament every week, we aren't just reminding ourselves Jesus is with us. We are experiencing his very presence. We are reminded that he has called us to himself. He has made us his own. He has called us saints and he will be with us as we topple idols and conquer armies, so to speak. On the precipice of battle, Gideon, the mighty man of warrior, question mark, just needed to know that God is with him. Because if this is truly the living God, then all he is, is all we need. Friends, the question is not how hard will life become. The question is simply, is the living God with us? I think Gideon teaches us that God calls normal and weak people. God qualifies those he calls. Gideon is weak and normal, but God calls him mighty because God is with him. God calls you in your weakness and your little bit of faith. He calls you a saint and he makes you one. In the Christian life, the life of the church is the messy and glorious and beautiful life of the people of God becoming who he's made us. And every week, we feast on the word and the sacrament. Let's pray. Father, we are reminded this week of your grace and your power that we are not unlike Gideon. We get our facts mixed up, mixed up. We misunderstand what the things in our life mean. We see the very things that you're using as obstacles. We think that you're just supposed to do all kinds of things for us. We don't think about all that you're doing in us and through us. 
And like Midian, Lord, we just cry out for more faith when we don't have it. And we believe that by faith, you will point us time and time again to an empty cross, an empty tomb, an occupied throne, that you'll point us to our Bibles, you'll point us to your body and blood shed for us to remind us, this is how you know I'm with you. This is how we know you're with us. Oh, we pray, Lord, we believe. Help our unbelief. And we ask that as we come to this table, you will strengthen our faith by simply reminding us that you are right here. It's in your name we pray. Amen.